start one. Star one. Star one. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everybody. This is Lloyd Auerbach at John F. Kennedy University in sunny California. And with me is Kathy Santini, our marketing director, who's going to give you a little uh, intro to GoToWebinar. And I also have a couple of students and faculty members sitting in the room with us, too. Um, to provide a little background noise as we go along. It is a pop culture lecture. Yeah, there talk you go. After all. all right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, if this is your first time uh, with using GoToWebinar, we'll just go through a couple of little logistical things here. Um, on the right side of your screen, you should see a control panel. And on the control panel, there's a little orange arrow, which allows you to hide or show the screen, the little control box, as works best for you. You also can control whether that um, appears or disappears by clicking on the view piece. It will tell you there whether to auto hide or not. So that's an option for you. We are doing this via phone. Oh, sorry. She's jumping ahead. I know. I gave a pre preview of coming attractions. So you can um, control the audio. If you go to audio on the block, you'll see the phone number to an access code to follow it, call in, and if you haven't, please do so. Um, I don't believe that you are able to participate via the computer. We do accept questions, and during the presentation, however, we will not address them to the end. You, on your bottom part, you will see a box for questions. Simply type in your questions or issues, and we will incorporate them at the end, or if you're having problems with anything, we will try and address that as we go through. So thank you again for joining, and I'll turn this back over to Lloyd to talk about pop culture consciousness. Okay, and I'm just actually entering in the, the, the numbers here into the chat box, and uh, just to be sure for folks who may not know, obviously you're not even hearing me at this week. So the folks who are on the phone, just keep, bear with me for one second here, um, so I can let the folks who are not aware of this know what to dial in. And this will take me just one second. Here we go. All right. Okay, so uh, this is part one of a two-part presentation uh, on pop culture and, and kind of how pop culture has influenced us uh, in a lot of ways. Pop popular culture in so many ways pretty much influences almost everything we know, everything from politics to just about anything else you can go to. And hang on just a second. Let's uh, next uh, slide if I can figure this out. There we go. All right, so really, popular culture both reflects what we're doing in terms of what's going on in the world in politics, in science, technology, in a number of areas. It's always going back hundreds of years. What is considered popular culture has kind of changed and reflected what's going on in the culture, but it also influences the culture. It's kind of a two-way street. And when it comes to ideas of consciousness, there's often a lot of shifting because of popular culture. And what I'm going to be talking about in this presentation and then the one I'm the second part in September is specific things, specific pop culture images and ideas that have influenced our ideas of consciousness and especially kind of some phenomena of consciousness such as psychic phenomena. So it really includes things going back to literature, prose and poetry. We can go all the way back to Gilgamesh if we really want to in Mesopotamia. Uh, the characters in Gilgamesh, which is the first both lengthy epic poem and also the first novel, they have superpowers. They do a lot of consciousness-oriented type of things. They reach out with their minds and change reality, and of course there are a lot of gods and demons involved in that. Music influences our pop culture. We all see that all the time. Uh, it even music today in the music industry influences everything today. Art has done this kind of thing, and art in many respects has been pop culture. We can go back to the days of cave paintings and even to the aboriginal days, uh, the early aborigines in Australia and rock paintings, that their pop culture literature was actually visual and it was storytelling through artwork. Theater has presented different ideas going from magic to the gods to religion, you name it, science and everything else. And of course the successor to, to theater is film and then television. And I'll talk a little bit as we go through here about uh, just touch on comic books and graphic novels because they're becoming more and more a piece of pop culture in our society today. 
sports and video games have also provided us with pop culture images. And you know, for a lot of people, that is popular culture. That's all it is. It's sports and video games. And then while the news may not be thought of too much as a popular culture icon, in reality, uh, and we're seeing that this week with the retirement of Jon Stewart from The Daily Show, just how much news, well, in this case what he calls fake news, influences us and our ideas about politics, religion, and everything else. All right. So let me just go ahead and next this one. All right, what's going on here? There we go. All right, so what is consciousness? And that's the first question. And the answer to that is we don't really know. Uh, even the definitions of consciousness are very wide and varied. Some people will use mind as referring to consciousness, soul, spirit, ghosts or consciousness. It's software in the brain. It's self-awareness. It's a particle or energy field. Depending on who you're talking to, what field they happen to be in, you'll find popular culture uh, and the sciences, and, and we're talking about the hard sciences and the, the soft sciences, the humanities, actually referring to consciousness in different ways. And one of the biggest questions in science today is the definition of consciousness, what it actually is. Next one. All right, so we're trying to do the chat and actually go to the next slide as we go along, and this is kind of uh, back and forth here. So bear with us. All right, consciousness comes, uh, you can come at consciousness and a definition, and this is kind of the split in science today. From a materialistic perspective where mind is the brain, in other words, mind or consciousness is an emergent property of the brain, it is just brain. We are just kind of meat robots. It's a kind of a crass way of putting it. Or you can look at it from a dualistic or even a pluralistic perspective that mind is greater than, different from brain, and there are a variety, there's a range of beliefs about this and a range of opinions uh, ranging from that consciousness comes into the brain when you're formed, when you're born, and leaves when you die, to consciousness is an emergent property of the brain but continues after death to the idea that consciousness doesn't even reside in the brain. The brain is like your TV set. Consciousness is the cable signal. So it's just coming through. So there are a lot of beliefs around this. And there's evidence for all of these things. Uh, the question is, which is the right thing? We don't really know yet. Oh, we're having, having a fun time here with, the, with going back and forth. OK. There we go. All right, so one of the first and earliest ideas um, in literature that really looked at the question of consciousness in an odd way was Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus, written in the early 19th century by Mary Shelley. It is a seminal novel of science fiction. It's kind of a bio-science fiction in the sense that we're talking about uh, patchwork man and resurrection. But it really is resurrecting someone with consciousness from a dead shell. Uh, the brain was dead, unlike the movie Young Frankenstein, where it was an abnormal brain, uh, it's hard to know whether or not the brain itself was the problem in the behavior of Frankenstein's monster, or whether or not there was something else. It could have been nature versus nurture in many respects. I'm going to talk a little bit about different pop culture sources. We are going to focus mainly on television tonight with a little bit of film. But we can talk about the sources of pop culture, which overlap quite a bit, uh, to ancient storytelling and theater which of course continues today. We have both of those things going on all the time. And oral story storytelling traditions are still in existence all over the world. And we do it ourselves. We're telling stories to our friends about different things we do. There is literature, written literature, going back hundreds of years, of course. And in the late 1800s, there was a new type of literature that was more pop, literally pop culture here in the United States and in other parts of Europe called dime novels. These were very inexpensive. Uh, novels and fiction, a lot of them were, were westerns and actually may have been responsible for the popularity of cowboys and Indians in British uh, society, uh, quite a bit of that in fact. Science fiction and science fantasy got started in the early 20th century, although again you can point back to things like Frankenstein as being the first for that. And horror and suspense has been around with us with ghost stories being told around the campfire for hundreds if not thousands of years. And in literature, uh, Again, going back to even before the event that spawned Frankenstein, which was a group of folks including Percy Bysshe Shelley and uh, John Polidori and, and Mary Shelley, which brought out the, the book Frankenstein in the early, 1800, early 1800s. In the early 20th century, the dime novels became pulps. And this, they were called pulps because they were printed on cheap pulped paper. And they were 
selling in the millions in this, the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and brought a lot of characters to life in the detective era, in the science fiction era. They really were responsible for science fiction and mystery books and such. Comic books came, had been around in the early 1930s, but it really was the launch of the superhero with Superman in 1938 that brought a new renaissance to the concept that human beings can gain powers beyond those of mortal men, to quote from the original TV series. Film provides us with a lot of uh, examples around consciousness, and I'll be talking about film more specifically in September, the September 15th date. And, of course, we start with the silent films. Uh, a lot of folks don't know that Thomas Edison himself actually produced films. And one of his first and early short films, which you can find on YouTube and in archive.org, is Frankenstein. He did a short version of Frankenstein. You can also find movies by um, L. Frank Baum, who wrote the Oz books. He adapted, he had his own film company, he adapted the Oz books to silent films, which are fun and they're in the public domain, fun to look at. Uh, there are films from the 19, from the teens, there's one which is not surfaced yet, called The Ghost Breaker. A couple versions of that, there was a play about this. And you have, of course, the rise of the talkies in the late 20s, which provided the spooky music that we see in science fiction and horror and other things that really kind of brought things out. And then another topic I'll talk about in September is the radio dramas, such as The Shadow, Who Knows What Evil Lurks in the Hearts of Men, The Man Who Was Trained in, the, in Tibet to Cloud the Minds of Men, to actually use consciousness ideas, to use principles of what they called the Orient back then to connect with people and, of course, go after criminals, because the weed of crime only bears bitter fruit. TV got started really experimentally in the 1920s. It came about with some broadcast in the 30s, not much, and really with the 1940s, especially the late 1940s, where we saw the golden age of television get started. Uh, for those of you um, who may be online who are, who are old enough to remember, there were shows in the late 40s that Milton Berle had, and, and even the early soap operas jumped from radio to television in the 1940s. So it actually goes back quite a ways, but it was the 1950s that a lot of folks considered the golden age. We had the Twilight Zone, which was the early 1950s, and that presented a lot of really interesting ideas. I'm sure you've all seen episodes of the Twilight Zone. There was a show that started the year before the Twilight Zone, very much like the Twilight Zone. Uh, the host was John Newland, who was also one of the directors and did kind of a Rod Serling thing. His show was called One Step Beyond. And the difference was the episodes of One Step Beyond were scripted based on people's experiences in prophecy, in psychic dreams, with ghosts, with ESP, with a variety of other consciousness-related topics. And there was even an episode of a more documentary type where a researcher named Andre Puharic, uh, the author of a book called The Sacred Mushroom, about the psilocybin mushroom in the 1950s, appeared. And since it was legal at that time, they actually did a little mushroom on, on TV, which is kind of interesting to watch. And that episode, The Sacred Mushroom, for One Step Beyond, is available on, on YouTube. Topper is uh, the show that got me interested. Uh, I was a TV baby. My dad worked for NBC. Topper, which was the 1950s and run again and again through the 1960s in syndication, uh, was a show about a couple of ghosts, I should say three ghosts, a couple uh, of fun-loving ghosts, and the St. Bernard who tried to rescue them from an avalanche when they all got killed. Um, it was a very unusual kind of show because one of the first shows where ghosts on TV appeared as main characters and they were fun-loving. Uh, they were also drinking a lot. Apparently, at that time in the 50s, ghosts not only smoked cigarettes from time to time, but they also drank spirits, of course. Uh, the dog drank more than anybody else. Popper's a fun show. You can find episodes of that still available. It is the show that really got me personally interested in a lot of this. And then in the counterculture TV came up in the 1960s. The real pop culture stuff, a lot of that appeared in the Batman TV series, but it was Star Trek that brought a lot of concepts from science fiction and from the consciousness world into the popular parlance. Uh, the early episodes of Star Trek really talk about the question of what is the mind. In the 70s, in publishing, there was the so-called occult explosion. You couldn't go anywhere without finding books on all sorts of new age and consciousness and mystic topics. And that was when the TV show In Search Of came about, uh, which was hosted by Leonard Nimoy and was a documentary type series that 
to this day holds up. And you can find episodes of that available online uh, and on DVD. In the 70s, also, talk radio started talking off, taking off and really focusing in some areas on consciousness-related, psychic-related, paranormal-related topics as well. There was a radio host named Long John Neville who was syndicated around the country, and he, had, he was the Art Bell of the time of the day, in fact. In the 1980s, we had a real shift in television. We had MTV, which has ch forever changed our attention spans by introducing the quick cuts. Uh, it used to be people had a much longer attention span, and MTV's quick cuts and what was introduced in television and film from that, from the music videos, has been credited or blamed for the shrinking of attention spans, which are shrinking even further with all the things pulling at our attention these days. The Discovery Channel got started as an actual science channel. That has changed since then, uh, probably ever since they introduced Shark Week, I think. Talk about pop culture. Uh, and then, of course, in the 1980s was the rise of cable television, from, the, from which, of course, these networks really were part of that rise. Uh, at the same time, there was the age of syndicated original television. Now, prior to mid-1980s, syndication meant reruns, and syndication meant to local talk shows or talk show, national talk shows, like Oprah. When Star Trek The Next Generation uh, came on in 1987, that was the first original scripted drama that made a, a splash on syndication and changed the face of syndicated television. Because for the next number of years, we don't see as much today of, on syndication because there's shifted now again, but we saw a lot of original programming in all sorts of areas because of Star Trek The Next Generation. And that show really delved into concepts of consciousness and who we are as human beings. At the same time, CNN and the 24-hour news channels forever, or I should say partly, they were partly responsible for this, changed what happens with news. Um, for those of you that might watch The Daily Show, you know there's a complaint about them. A lot of the networks, the 24-hour news networks, really just do, do, doing fluff and filling things in. And that is a problem. They have to actually find things to cover for 24 hours, and that's a tough thing to do. At the same time that was happening, network news was needing to compete with a lot of this. And NBC and ABC and CBS shifted their network news from not being a profit center. In other words, it didn't matter what ratings news got at that point, to being profit centers, meaning they had to get ratings. And that meant entertainment. And that's one of the reasons we see today that the news so often seems to be about getting entertainment or shock value than it is about actually presenting the news. It's actually a shift from neutral to somewhat biased or to kind of presenting things in a way that seems to get a lot more attention. Also, in the late 80s was uh, fortunate for writers and unfortunate for writers was the 1988 Writers Guild strike, which can be credited again or blamed for reality television taking off. Because what happened was most of network television at the time and some of the cable television was actually, you know, because network TV has been union ever since, uh, since the beginning, really. The network TV was mostly scripted. There were a few news programs here and there, but it was scripted. And scripted dramas means hiring actors and directors and producers and special effects sometimes and makeup people and writers. And because of the Writers Guild strike, which went on for quite some time, networks were scrambling to fill in those time slots with something. And from that, we got reality TV. And because reality TV was so cheap to produce, no writers, no actors, in fact, a lot of the so-called talent or the people who were on the shows weren't getting paid at all. You had a drive towards reality television, although some of those shows, like Survivor, are very expensive to produce. They just get a lot of ratings. In the 1990s, we had the expansion of cable TV from maybe 50 channels to 100 to more channels, as we see today. And the complaint has always been X number of channels on cable, and there's never anything to watch, which is what brought about on demand. We had the rise of reality TV, as I just mentioned. and from a perspective of the unusual and the strange, we had The X-Files, which is coming back this fall in a short series, in fact. The X-Files got a lot of attention. Um, they were covering a lot of UFO stuff, but they actually covered some mind-related, consciousness-related, psychic-related topics as well and explored that issue a little bit more than any other show had, of course, in a very, very different way that had gone on. In the 21st century, it really is so many channels and so many hours to fill. 
Uh, I'm constantly asked why there are so many new shows on new age topics, mystic, mystical topics, consciousness topics, paranormal topics, and it's not because there's that many people watching, it's because there are so many hours to fill. They have to fill with something, and reality TV is cheap to produce. But what's happening now is a big shift, and actually it's a positive shift. Uh, there is competition on the web from YouTube, but more from Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Yahoo Screen now has its original programming. A lot of these sites are actually, uh, even Sony PlayStation is doing its own channel, which you can get through the Sony Entertainment Network. So consequently, we've got these networks, which are subscription networks, different from the cable, that are actually giving free reign to some extent to the production people to come up with interesting dramas with interesting ideas that can explore different ways that networks could never do. They don't need sponsors. Sponsors have driven and, and been a problem in some respects. They've driven what the networks can put on. They've driven what the networks can't put on. They don't allow certain things that would be of interest to those of us interested in consciousness. It, you don't necessarily have, even have to worry about getting five million people to watch because as long as the as Netflix has bought it, the production company can do what Netflix will approve. Basically, as long as somebody watches it, it seems that network is going Netflix is going for it. So we're having those kinds of things happening and some much better programming, uh, which are now finally being recognized by the Emmys. I think that's a really important move by by the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. We also have internet radio and podcasting that's really taken off in the last fifteen years. So not only can anyone have a podcast these days, some of which are going to be good and some of which are going to be bad, but you have some really great people getting a good audience. Uh, and there's internet radio stations that are presenting some excellent explorations of these topics where before you had to find time on a radio station and find a sponsor. You don't have to do that anymore. So we have a lot more diversity and a lot more intelligent stuff. Unfortunately, with the intelligent comes the unintelligent. We get the dumb stuff. All right, so let's talk about themes with consciousness, because this is where the nerd in me can come out a little bit more. Um, fiction, in general, really can bring us many opportunities. It has been the case that many scientists over the years have often written science fiction or fantasy stories to explore ideas that they would have otherwise told their colleagues about and asked their opinion, but they may have been a little too out there for their colleagues to discuss but they can write them under the name, a pen name, and then ask if their colleagues have actually read this particular book, refer them to it without telling their colleagues that they themselves are the authors. And then ask later on, what did you think of that idea that sci-fi writer is talking about? And it's a safe way to present ideas and speculate and to test them out and promote them. Uh, there, there have been, I've met a number of researchers over the years in different fields, a lot of physicists who actually do this sort of thing. And eventually it comes, they get outed. And, but that's okay because their ideas have already been presented to their colleagues and they're being discussed in real scientific venues. This is happening with consciousness-oriented concepts as well to some extent. All right, so let's talk about the one theme, the theme of resurrection, bringing the dead back to life. This is a reactivation of consciousness. If we are, in fact, um, if consciousness is only the brain and it's resident and in the property of the brain, if you could bring the brain back to life, bring those neurons back to life, technically, bring that person back to life like rebooting a computer, All right? We're bringing the body back to life, bringing the brain. It could also be in some of the stories you have bringing the brain or body out of suspended animation. There are a number of stories about that. Uh, and people, of course, are trying to freeze. There are people who are frozen waiting for the day eventually when they can be revived, perhaps. Bringing the soul or spirit back in a new body. Uh, there was a recent movie about this where uh, Ben Kingsley's mind was shifted into uh, another body, in fact. We see that sort of thing in science fiction films quite a bit. So the resurrection theme comes up, of course, in Frankenstein in the films. But on TV, you have uh, multiple versions of this on Doctor Who, for any of you who might watch that. Uh, the current actor, I think, believe is the 12th incarnation because the character gets to die and then be resurrected as in, in a new actor's form. It's a way of uh, longevity for the show. There was a show called Dead Like Me where, where some of the characters were resurrected so that they could help other people transition to death show called Pushing Daisies, where they, uh, one of the characters was a resurrected person, just was kind of hanging on to life. And then the TV show Penny Dreadful, which is on Stars, brings a lot of the literary characters, such as Frankenstein and Dracula, into the storyline. And we have resurrection as a theme there. And, and a lot of questions from the creature, 
if you want to call him that, in Penny Dreadful, who is Frankenstein's creature, about what it means to be human and whether he's really a person or not. We see that with cloning stories as well. There have been stories about keeping the brain alive, a famous movie called Donovan's Brain, which has been made many times. Uh, usually the brain is kept alive in a jar or in a computer, uh, although there was um, the movie uh, where The Man with Two Brains, where Lily Tomlin's mind gets transferred into Steve Martin's body with Steve Martin, which is a very, very classic film and fun to watch. In a couple of episodes of Star Trek, we had uh, Spock's brain, where Spock's brain was stolen and then brought back to his body and reconnected. We have the, co the concept in Star Trek of the Vulcan consciousness, which can be stored in someone else's mind or in a vessel and then transferred back into a body. And the recent movie, relatively recent movie, Transcendence, where Johnny Depp's consciousness was transferred into a computer system and then, of course, went crazy. Because that's what you do in science fiction films. You know, you make people go crazy when they become computers. You have mind transfers. How many TV shows have we seen where people's minds switch, people switch bodies? This is a very, very common theme. There's actually a book from the 1920s which was made into a movie and even a TV show called Turnabout, uh, where a husband and wife switch minds. And, of course, hom comedy ensues when they're trying to live each other's lives for a little while. The Man with Two Brains I already mentioned. The famous movie Freaky Friday, the original version with Jodie Foster, the more recent version with Lindsay Lohan. And then uh, Star Trek episodes like Turnabout Intruder from the original series, but there's many, so many versions of this mind transfer thing. We see it all the time on so many TV shows and, of course, in a lot of films and in fiction. Survival of consciousness, the idea that our minds can survive the death of our body, this is one of the oldest concepts. Of course, it goes back to at least as far as early man. Uh, Neanderthals were buried with trinkets and tools for the next life. So the belief in the afterlife that you can survive the death of your body, there's archaeological evidence this is thousands, many thousands of years old. And ghost stories are among the oldest examples of oral, oral storytelling. So in the movies, and even on TV, there have been versions of this. Canterville Ghosts, which was Oscar Wilde's story from the 1800s, uh, a fun story to watch. And there's also Blythe Spirits, another one. On TV, we had Topper. We had The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, which some folks might remember. And you can find episodes of this. I was very happy to find so many episodes of The Ghost and Mrs. Muir on YouTube, including one called The Ghost Hunter with Bill Bixby as The Ghost Hunter. So that was a, that's a fun one. Uh, the old TV show Dark Shadows, not necessarily the movie with Johnny Depp, but the old TV show, uh, dealt with all sorts of issues of consciousness, including mind transfer and resurrection. It wasn't just about vampires, which is what most of the movies have been about. The movie Ghosts, of course, talk is a great example of consciousness after death and being a, a human being still, and then also the connection with the living. The Sixth Sense dealt with it, the film. Uh, there was a, show, a movie called The Others with Nicole Kidman, which is a very atmospheric, not so scary ghost story, but very much a Twilight zone -y kind of film. And then on TV, we've had shows like Ghost Whisperer and Medium and Being Human, which has a ghost as one of the main characters. We also have concepts of, of out-of-body experience, or you're in a crisis, you're trapped somewhere, and you project your mind to someone else so they see you as a ghost even though you're alive and you're just asking for help. And a couple of examples of that, one exa great example is a movie called Just Like Heaven with Reese Witherspoon, a nice romantic comedy where she's a woman in a coma who is, tr is basically projecting back to her old apartment as the new resident comes in. He thinks she's haunting him. She's still alive in the hospital and nobody knows she's there. Charlie St. Cloud deals with a, an ap a ghost of the dead and a ghost of the living, a crisis apparition, really cool story. And there was a recent one called If I Stay, again, someone who is in a coma who is projecting himself outside his body. Charmed, the TV show, dealt with this whole idea of leaving the body and going out and projecting, projecting your consciousness quite a bit. Uh, there was a TV show in the 80s, science fiction called The Powers of Matthew Starr which was about an alien prince who was being guarded by a federal agent here who had all these kind of special powers. And this happened also a few times in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. In fact, almost everything happened in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Reincarnation, which is believed by over a billion people on the planet. So it's a, it's a very major belief of many, many religions that consciousness, spirit, soul, whatever you want to call it, can survive the death of the body and be reborn in a new form whether it's typically in human form, but it can also be, as we know from Hindu beliefs, in forms of other creatures on the planet. Re the Reincarnation of Peter Proud was a very famous movie in the 70s. 
also very famous, also a Broadway play, was a Barbara Streisand film called On a Clear Day You Can See Forever, which was based on a famous reincarnation case back in the 50s called The Case for Bridey Murphy. And then there was a really atmospheric, suspenseful film with Kenneth Branagh called Dead Again, which I highly recommend. But on the TV front, reincarnation doesn't come up too often. Uh, an almost forgettable show, which is on YouTube, was My Mother the Car, where uh, a guy's mom got re reincarnated into the radio of a Model T Ford. Of course, they didn't actually have radios back then, but, you know, why quibble? It was, in fact, the first case of reincarnation that we ever saw. Dark Shadows dealt with, with reincarnation. And Babylon 5 had a lot of that happening as um, kind of a major piece for one of the main characters, having been reincarnated from one of the alien races, in fact. Near-death experiences show up quite a bit. Uh, the movie Flatliners with Julia Roberts, uh, not recommended to put yourself into a situation where you flatline, but that, that's what that was about. Uh, and there have been some other films that kind of have dealt in similar areas. The near-death experience of a woman was a main piece of Clint Eastwood's directed film, Hereafter, which was a wonderful film, uh, which covered different aspects of belief in the afterlife and how consciousness might connect after death. And her near-death experience is really amazing in that film. Resurrection with Ellen Burstyn, uh, that was a woman who had a near-death experience. And like many people, she was significantly changed philosophically, but it also came back with the ability to do healing and do other things. And that's something that people who have had near-death experiences have also reported. Uh, in more recent times, and actually going on right now, is the uh, TNT show Proof with Jennifer Beals. And it's a really fascinating film. I think it's a really good film. She's a cardiologist who is asked by a billionaire who is absolutely Steve Jobs, although not called that, um, a technology guy who wears a lot of turtlenecks. So uh, pretty clearly Steve Jobs. Ask, he's, a, he's dying, and he wants to know whether or not there's an afterlife. What's next? So he tasks a woman who doesn't believe in it, but who has had her own near-death experience to look into this question. And it's really, it, it, it started out a little rough, but it's getting really interesting, and I do recommend the show. There was a show called Saving Grace with Holly Hunter, which was also uh, about a near-death experience. Again, Buffy, and the TV show Supernatural, which is going to pop up a few more times in its 10th, 10th year. The afterlife and what it's like, of course, in religious texts comes about all over the place. But in films, we have varying versions of it. One of the nicer ones, or more creative ones, was What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams and Cuba Gooding Jr., which was based on a book by Richard Matheson, who was mainly known for writing horror stories, but also wrote this book, What Dreams May Come, a lovely story, and also wrote Somewhere in Time, which is a time travel romance story. Um, really good about how we create our own afterlife. A more uh, comedic version is Defending Your Life with Albert Brooks where he has to go through a life review in front of a panel and to help decide where he's going next. Uh, apparently, you have to wait online and take buses in, the, in that particular afterlife. The Book of Life was a recent animated film, came out last year. Um, and then we have, of course, Super, on TV, Supernatural, the TV show. There was a short-lived TV show called Brimstone, where a guy was brought back from hell to, bring, to send bad guys back to hell. We had Buffy the Vampire Slayer again. And it's one that almost nobody will remember, um, unless they're of a certain age. The Smothers Brothers, who were very famous for their political show, variety show in the 60s, had an earlier show, which is alternatively known as the Smothers Brothers Show or My Brother the Angel, where Tommy Smothers was killed and came back as an angel to watch over his brother. Uh, it's, uh, it's a silly show. And we have the idea of extending your consciousness, all right? So we're in our bodies, but we can evolve, we can reach beyond the body, we might gain superpowers and expand our minds and our intelligence couple of films. Uh, people can get boosted. And I think there's a new show called Limitless coming on this fall where a guy takes a pill and for a while he can have an incredibly, he has the full use of his brain. The film Forbidden Planet, which I'll talk definitely about more in the, in the next piece, 1956, the first big budget sci-fi film ever made and kind of the basis for Star Trek in many respects. Uh, it starred Leslie Nielsen before he was funny and also Walter Pidgeon as Dr. Morbius, a man who had found an ancient, buried, alien, civil, dead civilization and used a device to boost his brain, which led to all sorts of fun stuff. The Power was a 1960s film with George Hamilton and Michael Rennie about the next step in evolution and a bad guy who gained psychic powers. And then the more recent film, Lucy, um, Scarlett Johansson plays a woman who is given a huge dose of something that gives her 100% access to her brain, and suddenly, she not only sees reality different, she can change reality. In Star Trek, the, next, uh, the original series, both 
pilots, the original pilots that were done for Star Trek, where No Man Has Gone Before, which is the first pilot done with uh, William Shatner, and the previous one done with Jeffrey Hunter, The Cage, dealt with issues of mind expansion, evolution of consciousness, and going beyond what the body actually and brain has. This uh, has taught, showed up as a topic quite often on Doctor Who over the last 50 years, and of course there are many, many aliens on TV who seem to have this uh, some sort of boosted brain power, whether it, in, it includes having things inserted like me mechanisms inserted into their brains or not. Then there are psychic powers, and in this area there's a ton of TV shows, and this will continue to come up in television in many, many ways, and of course many films. I mentioned the movie The Power. Some of you may remember David Cronenberg's film Scanners, which was about a bunch of uh, telepaths and kind of a horror film. Um, it actually led to a Weekly World News headline that was uh, the Weekly World News, some of you may remember, was the black and white paper that used to be at the super, uh, supermarket checkout stands, the ones that had all the really crazy headlines about Saddam Hussein and uh, Osama bin Laden being gay and getting married and the Clintons adopting an alien baby and Elvis doing this after his death. And they made up their stories most of the time. And Scanners, there was a great, a great headline, which I still remember, from the 80s, which was Feigned Psychic's Head Explodes in ESP Experiment, which was all about the movie Scanners, actually. But it was a headline on this paper. Uh, Carrie, Stephen King's uh, book, and then film, Carrie with Sissy Spacek. There was a more recent remake, not as good. But the original was a very atmospheric, scary poltergeist case where a teenage girl who was being abused let loose at her high school prom because somebody um, hurt her, you might say. Uh, there is the more recent comedy film, What Women Want, with uh, Mel Gibson and Helen Hunt, where a guy actually gets the power to hear the thoughts of women. And again, comedy ensues, and romance in this case. The movie with John Travolta, Phenomenon, which is a really interesting film about a guy who has a tumor and suddenly develops these powers. And then you're left with a question at the end of the film, which is very interesting about consciousness. And the, t the movie The Dead Zone, based on Stephen King's book, about a man who can see the future for people when he touches them. Um, not exactly, he had to actually grab them or touch them, and that became a, a TV show, actually, that was a fairly, uh, it ran for several years on cable. Another film was Powder, uh, which was about a kid who had, was an albino kid who had psychic powers, mainly telekinetic powers. The movie Minority Report, based on a Philip K. Dick story with Tom Cruise, which is now going to be a TV series about a pre precogs or precognitives who work with police. We have the movie Next with Nicolas Cage, an interesting film. Uh, some of the Cage's films are rather bizarre, and some of them are just plain interesting and fun to watch. And this is a more fun to watch one. He plays a mentalist, a guy like a performer in Vegas, who turns out can actually see a few seconds into the future. And because he can see a few seconds into the future, he can pick up stuff from his audience members who are going to tell him or confirm what he's about to say which is something we deal with in parapsychology. But then he also is on the run from the government, and it helps this ability to see a few seconds to the future actually helps him kind of stay ahead of them. Dune, uh, with a book by Frank Herbert and the different versions that appeared, deal with psychic powers in a lot of ways. There was a, um, oh, there's actually two movies listed here, The Last Wave and Jumper. Those should be on two different lines. The Last Wave was a really interesting book, uh, TV, to me, film with Richard Chamberlain about an aboriginal prophecy in Australia of a wave, like a tsunami, destroying Australia. And it's based on Aboriginal mythology, and it's a really atmospheric, very mythologically based story that I think you'd get a, a kick out of if you want to take a look at that. It's, it is available on DVD, and it, and it probably is available through Netflix or one of the others as well. There was another one called Where the Green Ants Dream, also based on Aboriginal ideas of consciousness. Jumper was about guys who could actually teleport themselves mentally. And then there was a movie called The Gift, where um, we had a character who actually had the psychic gift, of course. Then we can talk about Star Wars, the Jedi, and the Sith forever. Uh, I, I'd almost have to do an entire s course on that just alone. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. On TV, most people do not remember this, uh, but you can find reference to it on YouTube, not a full episode, called The Girl with Something Extra, which starred Sally Field. It was after she did The Flying Nun, and she was a, a woman who actually had ESP, and she was just getting married. It was John Davidson, and she revealed to her, her guy that she had, she had psychic powers. Again, it was a sitcom, really kind of fun thing. There was a British TV show called The Champions, which you can find on YouTube, 
about three agents of an international organization, who kind of crime-fighting organization, who crash in the Himalayas, and some secret Tibetan or Himalayan uh, civilization heals them and gives them special powers as well, which is kind of ex very interesting. And, it's done a, and they use that without telling their boss. The three of them use that to kind of deal with international crime. There's the Tomorrow People, and there's been a British version from the 70s, where the next step of evolution were people with psychic powers, and the more recent version on the CW uh, that is available on Netflix and Amazon Prime. You have the Dead Zone TV series. Of course, many episodes of Star Trek have featured ESP and psychokinesis and all sorts of things, and the same with Doctor Who. He even has um, a piece of, of psychic paper for people looking at it. It reads the minds of the people looking at it, so they will see whatever they think they're going to see when he's trying to get into places like a fake passport or something else. We have psychics and mediums appearing on TV, not just in the reality shows, but The Dead Zone, of course, Medium with Patricia Arquette based on the work of uh, actual an actual medium. Same thing with The Ghost Whisperer. Both of those were based on actual mediums. Babylon 5, a TV series that ran for a number of years, has an entire psy core, people who are telepathic and have other powers and are kind of like the secret service, uh, except more like the KGB than anything else. Heroes, and coming up, the new version of Heroes on NBC, Heroes Reborn, which is coming up this fall. Talks about people with who have suddenly developed these additional powers. I mentioned the Tomorrow People, and of course Supernatural has all sorts of people with mental abilities far beyond those of the rest of us. And then we have to talk, talk just briefly, say something about non-human consciousness. Aliens, extraterrestrials, I'm, I'm not even going to go into a lot of examples, any examples here, other dimensional beings, demons and angels. Okay, talking animals. Mr. Ed, we have to talk about consciousness in a very different way. And there have been other talking animals, including, I have to say, Scooby-Doo. He can't talk very well, but he certainly talks better than some of the other characters on that show. And then there's all sorts of artificial intelligence we can kind of deal with for, for different versions on television and everywhere else. A couple of examples of non-human entities, aliens that have uh, special consciousness or different consciousness. We have the cage with these aliens that can actually project illusions to everyone. Aaron of Mercy, which is an episode of Star Trek about these aliens in what looks like a backward world who actually have no form. They're actually only beings of mind, pure mind, and they tell everyone, mentally tell everyone, broadcast what they want people, living people to see. Squire of Gothos was an early episode with a guy who was super evolved but a kid, it turned out, who could change reality and play with it with his mind. And then there was Wolf in the Fold, which is an episode where Jack the Ripper was actually an alien energy entity feeding off people's fear and would possess people from planet to planet. On Star Trek The Next Generation, any episode with the, the being the Q, uh, we had an episode called Power Play, which was about an expansion of consciousness for one of the characters by some aliens where he literally... Uh, his brain and his consciousness expanded, so he took over control of the ship and many other things. And my favorite episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, The Measure of a Man, in which Lieutenant Commander Data, who's an android, artificial intelligence, is being requested to be taken apart, and he doesn't want to be. So it boils down to a legal argument, but a philosophical one, on what makes a person, or what makes a person, what makes one conscious, and what makes one sentient. So the question came up when they're discussing, is an artificial man conscious? Was Captain Picard saying to the other characters, prove to me that I'm conscious? Because we can't. We don't even have a definition of that today. I mean, hopefully in the 24th century they will. But we don't. So it's a real fundamental question that we have to consider. And then, of course, covering everything is Star Wars from consciousness outside the body to consciousness being everything. The force itself is consciousness of the universe. It's the living force that binds everything together, as, Luke, as they talked about in the first Star Wars film. And the Jedi and the Sith tap into that consciousness. And of course, there are folks who believe that the universe itself is conscious, that there are different degrees of what we can even call consciousness, but that reality does not exist with some form of con without some form of consciousness observing it and interacting with it. And that goes from the quantum physics aspect to the macroscopic world. There are different philosophies coming from physics or connecting to physics that really kind of feed off of this idea that everything has some energy or consciousness that connects with everything else and interconnectedness. And that's kind of 
where a lot of people in the consciousness world are who are not coming from the materialistic perspective, that we actually do have interconnected consciousness. And it, it's a fundamental question that we have to look at. Star Wars is one way that it's being explored. Um, I'm looking forward to the new films and seeing what they do with it. I know a lot of the books that have come out have explored this issue in different ways. And again, science fiction allows one to take ideas that would not necessarily be um, cool to talk about within the sciences or the philosophy or in psychology, and you can present them and talk about them and tease them apart and, and speculate all you want, and it's only a story. But at the same time, it can get people talking. And while Star Wars seems to be a, a fan-based, nerdy thing for a lot of people, it really can get people going. And in fact, it spawns some religion in some respects. Uh, the Jedi Church, is the Jedi religion is accepted. It's a, it's a recognized religion in Australia. Over 80,000 people in one of the last censuses put themselves down as Jedi for their religion. And actually in New Zealand, there is a Church of the Jedi, which is following precepts of this. And sooner or later, it will go from sci-fi cult to something else. We know that. All right, but let's talk, kind of finish up tonight before we take questions, in the last five minutes, uh, talking about reality TV. You know, we talk about reality TV, and you can go from documentary television to entertainment, and most reality TV, or what's called reality TV, is not documentary. It is entertainment. And this is because of cable TV and the need for ratings. Documentaries typically don't get ratings. They're news programs. They're considered people by people boring. And I'm so happy to see Netflix buying documentaries. People are getting documentaries on Netflix. And this is happening in some of the other services as well. This is, this is really great because we now have an outlet besides PBS for these things that actually have really good background research to them, where the entertainment shows do not. So the pop culture outlets, which include a lot of these reality TV shows uh, dealing with these issues, the bad is they can promote false representations, exaggerations, and downright lies. And i got to tell you, um, watching some of the shows that deal with topics that I'm interested in, there's a lot of um, stretching the truth uh, and even presenting folklore as fact and even making things up out of whole cloth that happen here, uh, and all sorts of reality television. We, uh, we, we think we're watching something real. Uh, I worked with Mark Burnett for a short time, who did, did Survivor, and you know what you see is not everything that's happening, and people always get worried about the folks who are on these islands and places that have no food, and granted, they are not supposed to eat any food, but I can tell you there's a huge crew involved there, and the crew, who are union, go off and away from the people who are on that show, and they get fed really, really well. The people who are the focus of that may not, but if anything happens to them, they have paramedic on station. They have doctors there because they're in a location without hospitalization, and the crew needs that. That's a union rule. So what you're seeing on TV is what the producers want to show you and what the networks want to show you. And remember, they may be cutting 30 hours down to three minutes. So that's about the editing. It often sacrifices even a seed of good information in favor of entertainment. That's really important. And they will label things true, even if it's barely based on truth. Uh, there was a show, there were several shows that say that they're based on true reports. What that means is if somebody calls up 911 and says on 911, they're aliens abducting me. And it turns out that person truly is paranoid schizophrenic, and there's nothing going on at all, or they're having a bad trip on LSD or something else. There literally is nothing. The police go out there and find that out. That report can be used now for the basis of a TV show, and they can say it was based on a true report. Because it truly was reported. It just wasn't true. It didn't actually happen. And that's what you see with reality television. It can be convincing enough that people don't question or look for confirmation. It can bring down the skeptics and those presenting ideas similar to or at the root of pop culture portrayals. So those of us in the consciousness, um, mystic vision, any time you're dealing with philosophy or new ideas or even old ideas, there are skeptics. But when pop culture, especially reality TV and supposed documentaries, present the wrong information, it really can bring, bring down the ire of the negative the naysayers on the people who are trying to do the good work. And it actually presents people with bad science and often worse philosophy. On the good side, you can get new ideas that are being considered by people in the public who have never seen those ideas. They're exposed to new ideas. That's good. Uh, speculation, inspiration, education can even come. But unfortunately, the last part, the education part, you know, unless they're referring people to sites, to places to go, or good sources, that doesn't happen. 
that can certainly give those of us in the field of consciousness studies and areas around that talking points. In fact, I use, personally use Ghostbusters and its goofiness back in the 80s as a great talking point to say, we're not really like that, but everybody thinks that's cool. And in fact, the media used to say, we know you're not like that, guys. What do you really do? And that's a good question. I don't want to hear people say, take me to the Amityville house. I want them to say, okay, that's not real. What's it really like? It should be a contrast. It also causes people sometimes to look for more information because they are interested. It can give us, again, talking points. It can allow us to raise and discuss questions. We have images, familiarity. I'm talking about pop culture images, and I can use these images that people are familiar with. I certainly do it when I'm talking to folks who are familiar with some of the ghost hunting shows. I do it when I'm talking about people who are familiar with ideas of consciousness that they get from TV shows and film because you use that as a contrast and as a starting point. It, it levels the playing field to allow you to really present good information and take that curiosity you may have that came from watching that TV show or movie and expand on it. Jeffrey Kripal said in his book Mystics and Mutants, or Mutants and Mystics, consciousness needs culture to know itself as and in us, just as culture needs consciousness to exist at all. That's a highly recommended book. And remember, it's all about consciousness. And I guess we're time for questions. The folks, by the way, who, have, who were not signed up for the last time I was going to do this back in June, I did send out the PDF. I do have PDF of the slides. If you'd like them, just send me an email. Um, that's my email for JFK University. And I can send you some other material as well. And this will also, this presentation will also be up on YouTube in the not too distant future on the JFKU uh, YouTube channel. And please take a look at our website for more information on our program. And if you're here in the Bay Area, we have many events coming up in the fall. So let's see if we have any actual questions. So we do have a question about what kind of insights do you think some of these shows have given to consciousness? And, it's, and also kind of, is it a little bit of maybe chicken and egg? You know, is what you're seeing on TV then prompting some exploration? exploration? Well, you know, it, it's really interesting. Um, the chicken or the egg thing is always a really big question, especially with science fiction. Uh, science fiction often has been uh, predicting things. Jules Verne predicted in his stories uh, the atomic submarine. He predicted that the first moonshot would go from Cape Canaveral. Can you believe this? Back in the 19th century, he located the, the moonshot for from the Earth to the moon at this little peninsula, this little cape in Florida. Now, was that psychic, or was it putting the idea in somebody's head? He predicted lasers and television and all sorts of things. But he was a, a student of science at the time, and he might have actually been able to consciously spec out what could have come next. Um, it's always said that the, the one thing that science fiction writers didn't predict was the silicon chip. Because no one in science fiction predicted that. No one. Uh, but everything else, you can find that. So it is a chicken or the egg thing. With consciousness questions, a lot of science fiction writers who are very familiar, who have written on topics in consciousness and put them in their stories, are familiar with the literature. I mean, people are always surprised sometimes when the sci-fi writer says, oh, I read all this stuff. You know, I read all your, your material in order to go forward. So, for example, Richard Matheson, who I mentioned, who uh, did What Dreams May Come. Matheson, who died um, I think two years ago now, uh, he wrote a lot of the Twilight Zone episodes. He wrote all the horror stuff. He wrote, he wrote the, the, the movie The Legend of Hell House and also the book Hell House. But he wrote Somewhere in Time, which is about sending your consciousness and your physical body back in time. He did base that on research. He did the same thing with uh, What Dreams May Come. He, I have a friend of mine who knew him very, very well and knows his son very well. Matheson is, was one of the more researched, well-read and well-researched people when it comes to these concepts. He had an amazing library, I understand, in consciousness and parapsychology and all sorts of other topics. And, and religious top ideas around the world. And he read everything and put that to make his stories seem real. And so you have that end of things as well. So I think that there are writers, not so much maybe on the TV shows, but certainly in film from time to time, who've run across things that they read in the literature of consciousness studies, in literature of these other areas. And that is the seed of an idea for the story. Um, Chris Carter the creator of the X-Files. Um, mm -hmm. he, he and I were at a conference together for Mensa back in the early 90s. And he was talking to the, there were all these UFO people there. And some of them, one of them in particular, I remember was putting out a newsletter. And uh, he was talking to her about it. Um, I mean, he was kind of a surfer dude. 
you know, blonde hair. He, he's called himself a surfer dude, actually, before he came up with the idea for the X-Files. And at some point during the Q&A with him, the woman who put out this newsletter about all these UFO cases um, asked him whether or not, you know, first she said, I want to thank you for telling the truth on the X-Files. And he got a little bit antsy, and he said, look, uh, I have to tell you the truth here. Here's the truth. We subscribe to your newsletter. We subscribe to all your newsletters. When we're looking for a story idea, we read your newsletters. So if you're seeing your truth in my show, it's because I copied your truth. It doesn't mean it is the truth. It's that sense of familiarity. So you do see that happening from time to time in television as well. Certainly we see that with shows that are based on real life events that keep popping up. Which, which happens, especially with cop shows, you know, Law and Order pulls from that. There's a lot of things that are in the headlines. Next thing you know, they're, they're scripted dramas. But I will say that um, there was, you know, a lot of discussion about Star Trek predicting everything. It turns out um, Chatner, William Chatner wrote a book, and there was actually a, a couple of documentaries about this. A lot of the folks at NASA credit Star Trek with getting them into NASA. A lot of technology folks credit Star Trek with the germs of the ideas. So, for example, the guy who invented the flip phone, that came for the original Star Trek communicator. Uh -huh. They weren't predicting anything. It gave him the idea. Yeah. And I think people in, con in the consciousness studies world needs to need to really look at fiction and the fiction that's out there. I, don't, I talk to a lot of folks who, who do consciousness study stuff, and, you know, I'm a nerd. I'm, I'm, I'm self-admitted. Um, I don't see a lot, of, a lot of them, and I don't talk to a lot of them who actually have read a lot of the literature, the fiction that's about this which would allow them, again, talking points and allow them to explore ideas. And they should be writing some of this stuff. Well, actually, since you brought up Star Trek, we do have a question about did Star Trek and Star Wars actually spark some of the growing interest that we've seen in consciousness lately? I, you know, I think that um, Star Trek certainly has, especially with the re resurrection of Star Trek in the 80s with the next generation, with, the, with that generation of people watching the show, because they explored the issue, newer issues, they actually explored issues of consciousness that were still being discussed philosophically in ways that I hadn't seen before. Um, and some other shows have done that as well. So I think it really did spark some interest in that area. Mm -hmm. Star Wars, for an entire group of people who started with, certainly has made talking about it easy. You know, I can talk to um, comic book readers uh, and I can talk to science fiction fans about consciousness, parapsychology topics, without even having to define terms. I, I don't have to say, I, I can just simply launch into talking, we're Star Trek fans, I just launched right into talking about this. Because they're already pre-educated, even from, though it's from a fictional perspective. Mm -hmm. And while there is a small segment of fandom that does believe that stuff is real, <laughs> which we saw on Saturday Night Live uh, so many years ago, uh, there were also that was those people who watch soap operas and think those are real too. My <laughs> uncle was a soap opera director, and I know that for a fact. And of course, there are a lot of people who watch the Ghost Hunter TV shows and think everything they see in those shows is real. Uh, any reality TV show, people think there is a segment. But most people see that as being able to talk about this, which is great. Okay. Um, and then another question, would you place the ghost hunting shows in the same category as other reality shows, since you brought up ghost hunting? Yeah, I, I would absolutely. <laughs> uh, the ghost hunting shows, unfortunately, and have been involved, I've been involved in TV shows, they are subject to the same whims of producers and everybody else and every other show that's out there, unfortunately. Any of the shows with psychics, any of that stuff, uh, everything should be taken with a big, a huge, not a grain of salt, but a piece of rock salt. <laughs> <laughs> big salt crystal. Salt, salt crystal. Even if you see me in the show, take with a big rock crystal. Yeah. All right. All right. So. Um, well, I hope to see everybody back for the September right. 15th. Uh, piece, and I'll be making sure I'll, I'll send out an email to everyone about, we'll make sure you're on the list for that. Right. And again, if you're in the Bay Area, I hope you join us for our live presentations that we have coming up in October and some other webinars we have coming up as well. Right. So again, uh, we will be having the link, we'll be posting this on YouTube, um, so you can view it and share it with others, and we will send out an email about that as well. So thank you everybody for participating, and have a great evening. May the force be with you. <laughs>